Welcome, everybody, to a new episode of IBKR Podcasts. My guest today is Brian Tancock from Visual Sectors. And today we're going to discuss the landscape of options trading and liquidity and how data within the options market can be used predictively to help investors build market neutral equity portfolios. Welcome, Brian. How are you? Andrew, very well. It's good to be with you. It's excellent to have you on the program. Can you explain, first of all, Brian, why you embarked on this journey and where has it delivered you to? So when we think about the meme stock craze that happened a few years ago, we saw some pretty fantastical instances of coordinated options positions really driving wild price action in the equity markets. And while this phenomenon that we know as being gamma squeezing is nothing new, it was kind of a wake up call to retail investors, if you will. There's been a lot of academic research that's gone on in this space for decades prior to the whole meme stock craze. And a lot of institutional, sophisticated institutional buy side firms have long since used options data in order for them to build uh, return streams that are completely not correlated to the broader market. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the power of options data and put that in the hand of retail investors to help them make better trading decisions. And so where it's gotten to us now, where this has gotten us now is that we've been able to synthesize massive amounts of data and put this in the hands of our users to help them make better trading decisions. So in, in terms of the landscape, the, how has trading changed for retail investors in the age of AI and bots? So there's always going to be a danger in any trade, whether that be a short-term trade or a sophisticated asset class getting overcrowded. And we're starting to see this in private markets right now. What were long thought to be, or what have long been sophisticated niche asset classes we're now starting to see evidence that they're being diluted and the returns of the performance are being negatively affected. And so this can happen in the trading space as well. Now for traders, especially the uninitiated, a lot of times they kind of fall into the trap of the technical analysis or the trading guru. Those who are able to move past that, a lot of them have gone into the algorithmic space. And while they've been able to enjoy some edge from trading skill, Again, that has the same risk of, be of becoming overcrowded and those returns being becoming diluted. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to enable traders to build more of a mathematical edge and try to rely less on building trading skill enable, and more on reducing churn and building a true mathematical edge that can persist. So, so Brian, how would you assess the changes to the overall trading environment over the last five years, say? Yeah, well, I'm certainly not breaking any news to you when I say that the S&P 500 has completely changed to where we are in modern times. Right now, the 10 largest companies in the S&P 500 make up 40% of the overall capitalization. Just two years ago, that number was 27%. So the concentration risk has become exponential. Now, a large, <clears throat> excuse me one second, so the concentration risk is growing exponentially. And a lot of this is being driven by these passive index funds. And so what were once thought to be safe, well-diversified investment tools are now potentially turning into completely different phenomenons, if you will, with potentially a lot more risk and a lot more concentration risk. So if one or two of these companies were to experience some type of black swan event, say at the same time, the entire risk structure that we've come to know with broader markets could be completely redefined. Even after all the data and the, everything that we experienced in 2008, we could be looking at a radical shift in overall market risk. And so that's something that we need to be cognizant of here going forward. So another thing that we're seeing is we're seeing larger evidence of speculation in markets. So if you look at the, if there are two Another thing we're seeing is that we're seeing growing evidence of speculations driving markets. So if we look at two of the small cap indices, the S&P 600 and the Russell 2000, if we simply subtract, well, first of all, the S&P 600 has a profitability screener. So the companies in the S&P 600 are of a much higher quality than those in the Russell 2000, generally speaking. So if we simply subtract the returns of the S&P 600 from the Russell 2000, what we're able to do is we're able to isolate a net zero exposure return factor that we call speculation. And on the other side of the speculation is what we would call quality. So if we look at this metric, this return factor, going back to 2000, 
cumulative, cumulatively, quality has outperformed speculation by 26%, roughly 1% a year. But here in 2025, that number of speculation, speculations returned. Here in 2025, speculation has returned 7.5%. That's the single largest return of that factor on record. Even more than in 2020, when everybody was sitting at home, day trading with their stimulus checks. So what is the way forward, do you think, for retail investors? So if we look at the financial crisis of 2008, Citadel, by some reports, they lost up to 55% of their flagship fund. And this was really from everything that we've gleaned from this very private institution. So this was a defining moment for Ken Griffin, and they completely changed their approach. They adapted more of a risk parity approach. And this is something their chief risk officer, Joanna Welsh, an incredibly bright woman, has spoken about on many occasions. And this is also an approach that Jim Simons used at Renaissance Technology. And this is something that we preach to our users, the importance of building long-term advantages from a market-neutral approach to investing and trading, especially given all the risks we're seeing right now in the broader economy, fiscally, and just structurally, if you will. And so that's something that we're paying a lot of attention to right now. So the, the thought of new data sets is an interesting topic in, 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 in itself. You wrote an article about options data use cases to predict stock moves. Can you explain how that works a little bit, please? So, yeah, so when we look at the academic research that's been done on this space, there are really four pillars of options data that have demonstrated predictive capacity for the underlying stocks. And those are asymmetric information, hedging demand, embedded leverage, and then finally, uh, the mathematical principle that's known as crowd wisdom. So, so what are these exactly? So asymmetric information refers to when a market participant, whether that be a fund manager or a trader, wants to express conviction in a single name. They're going to prefer securities that allow them to size that exposure maybe better than simply just the equity. And this is where options come into play. And so how this manifests itself is in the presence of what we see as the option to stock volume ratio. So when we see traditional option to stock or OS ratios behave differently than they have historically, this might be an indication that there's what we call asymmetric information entering into the market. The second pillar being hedging demand refers to the delta hedging requirements that dealers who are on the other side of these trades are forced to maintain for their own risk management purposes. And so as options volume has exploded, these dealers are now forced to move around more and more shares of stock to maintain their delta neutral position. And evidence has shown that the effects of hedging demand can influence underlying stocks for up to five days moving forward. So the third one we're seeing is embedded leverage. And so this builds on the concept of information asymmetry. So when a manager wants to build a position, a lot of times they're going to look to take advantage of the embedded leverage that options provide them. And so when we see changes in open interest along the chain, say out of the money puts, out of the money calls, this can also represent that there may be information asymmetry that's entering into that particular stock at that time. And then finally, the last one is the mathematical concept known as crowd wisdom. So crowd wisdom shows that the collective predictive capacity of a crowd is better than that of a random individual. And when that crowd is made up of experts, the predictive capacity is even greater. So when we talk about options markets, we know that roughly 60% of trading volume is being dictated by institutional investors. So the concept of crowd wisdom has been shown to be more effective in forecasting stock prices than say regular, just a random selection, if you will. And so in practice, this signal is enhanced by what we know as options order data types. So if we can isolate, so if we can isolate opening buy orders and put call ratios with opening buy orders on puts and opening buy orders on calls in accordance with put call ratios, investors have been able to generate excess risk adjusted returns by evaluating those metrics. So how do you actually transition from stock picking to managing portfolios then? So while we preach using single names versus passive indices in building portfolios, we still place an emphasis on risk parity. So we want to make sure that no one position in a portfolio carries more risk than any other position, if you will. So we focus on position sizing in order to get this done. Another thing that we're able to do for our users is that we've accumulated large 
a large cache of data, if you will. And so we're constantly using methods to, we're constantly back testing and using different iterations of trading signals and risk management techniques in order to find improvements on our current approach. And is that how you, is that how you compose market neutral portfolios? Yeah. So like we touched on before, we're big proponents of the market neutral approach, especially given all the red flags that we're seeing in markets at the moment, we're working to empower traders to be able to trade more like a hedge fund unless it may be like a YouTube guru who's drawing lines on a line on lines on a chart, if you will. So when we look at changes in markets, especially as markets become more volatile, we've seen historically that asset classes that are meant to be risk diversifying asset classes tend to become more correlated. Evidence has shown that during times of stress, equity market neutral portfolios or just market neutral portfolios do a better job at maintaining their diversifying characteristic, meaning their low covariance to a broader market than say a traditional risk diversifying asset like a bonds will. So this is something that we're trying to help traders to understand, especially as we see forward markets being a lot more, un especially when we see forward markets being less predictable than they currently are. If we look at the dot-com boom of the late nineties, it was followed by a lost decade for broader markets. You know, are we really so arrogant to think that that can't happen again? So what we want to do for retail investors is that this is going to be very difficult for them to build a market neutral portfolio on their own, but we're giving them the benefit of our expertise, of our knowledge and our experience to help them to do this, to better navigate markets going forward. And I think we're going to run a webinar about this topic in December. Is that right, Brian? That's right. We're looking forward to that. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing a few of the visuals that you've just explained in today's episode on screen. So we'll look forward to that. I think that's December the 4th, is it? Yes, sir. That's correct. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Brian. Andrew, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, my guest today, Brian Tancock from Visual Sectors. And to the audience, remember to subscribe to our channel wherever you download your podcast from. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry, or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. This material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances, and as necessary, seek professional advice. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For information on the uses and risks of options, you can obtain a copy of the Options Clearing Corporation Risk Disclosure Document titled Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options by going to the following link ibicard.com slash OCC. Multiple leg strategies, including spreads, will incur multiple transaction costs.